as well as to the Israel of his day. O rebellious house, I will say the word in performance, says the Lord God. Again, again, the word of the Lord came to me, say, son of man. Look, the house of Israel is saying, the vision he sees is for many days from now. Things are going to continue on as they always were. We're going to come out of this COVID thing, okay? Our social security will be intact. The vision, this is what Israel was saying in those days, and I hear some of it in Israel today. This is just a health care crisis. Uh-uh. The vision that he sees is for many days from now, he prophesies of times afar off. Therefore, say to them, Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be postponed anymore, but the word which I speak will be done, says the Lord. I draw, I draw comfort from that, don't you? God's got this. Yes, the passage that, <clears throat> that Ray just read from Daniel chapter 12 is focused on the final events of Earth's history. And if our historical understanding is correct of the end time then that end time began when? 1798 was the end of the 1260-day prophecy. If you keep that in mind, that the end time began in 1798, then some of the hard stuff that i got to say a little bit later will make more sense. Because this Revelation 17, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time into it, I'm just going to build up to it. Maybe another time. It's the most mysterious of all prophecies. I've heard so many different explanations of Revelation 17, I've kind of given up on it a little bit. Until a book was put in my hand, and as far as I know, it's the last one available on Amazon or any books. But we're going to get it republished. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the book. It's called the Time of the End. By Seventh-day Adventist thinker, one of the, my two favorite thinkers of the 20th century, George McCready, looks like McCready, not McCready, but it's McCready Price. Born in 1870, the contemporary of Ellen, died the year I graduated from high school. He wrote this book when he was 93 years old. Time of the End. Never seen Revelation 17 unpacked like he unpacks it. If he's wrong, then I gotta go look at some, somewhere else. I think he's dead right because we're living Revelation 17 right now. Oh, but Dale, uh, we just want a smooth saccharine sermon today. No. Just a sweet sermon. Make us feel good. No, I don't think we need any more saccharin. I think we need a little black pepper. <laughs> Stacy and I were at a convention in D.C. I believe this last fall. This is came in my head. This is not my notes. And we've become really good friends with Bill from Hillsdale College. And Bill was telling us, and I think I might have told this before, but it fits here as well. Bill's telling us that he was leaving his uh, Lutheran church in, in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And I said, why? He said, well, I had a conversation with the pastor. The pastor wants to go all full bore with this social justice, politically correct, LGBT ideology. And so Bill's a real outspoken guy. He said, I went to the pastor and I said, pastor, are we straying away from the Bible here? But we got to be compassionate, Bill. We got to be compassionate, Bill. Don't you know, Bill, that the church is a hospital for sinners? Bill said yes, but in your church, nobody will ever get well. Woo! 
he speak the truth? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When we stray away from the Word of God, we, so that means we got to know it. That's why the devil doesn't want us to know the Word of God. When we stray away from the Word of God, sinners don't get well. So 1260-day prophecy ended in 1798. Revelation 17 begins to unfold. A quote from an 81-year-old woman. I love these older people because I'm becoming more and more one of them. She's speaking to those who want sweet and easy things. She said this in 1909. I could talk about 1909 for the next 10 or 15 minutes because of what was happening in this country in 1909. She wrote these words. Are we to wait for the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? I mean, she wasn't talking about the mark of the beast right here. She's talking about other stuff running up to it. We have sometimes fixated on that one event. And my argument today is if we don't see and understand the events leading up to that event, we're going to be deceived by that event. Mm. She says, shall we wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall on the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the Word of God? 19, page 20, if you want to reference. So this is an end of, the time, end of time sermon. I pray not delivered dogmatically because I'm just figuring, I'm just seeing some things Brother Christ has taught me in his book. All biblical. 1798. Mark it well. The end of the 1260-year relationship of religion and politics in the same camp. Signaling the time of the end. What took place that year? Napoleon's General Berthier demanded that Pope Pius VI abdicate his temporal authority. You can be head of the church, old boy, but you're not going to be head of the state. Pope Pius VI says, I've been given this by God. I'm not going to, I'm not going to obey you, General Berthier. What does Berthier do? <clears throat> After he whips the armies of the papal state, states, he takes him to France he dies less than a year later. That was a wound delivered to the beast. Separation of church <clears throat> and state. Now just a refresher. The Roman Emperor Justinian, <clears throat> interestingly, I just discovered this this week, was refer is referred to by some uh, scholars, historians, as the last Roman. Because it was during his era that the Pope was put up not only over the church, the Bishop of Rome, but over other temporal or political issues. That happened during his era, during his time of 538. What do you add? You add 1260 to 538. What's the new date? 1798. So fix that in mind, your mind. I can't say that often enough. 1798 began with the deliverance of a deadly wound to the head of the papacy, separating the church and state. Oh, I used to hear this as a kid. But Dale, don't you know that in 1929, the Lateran Treaty in Italy between Mussolini and the Pope restored papal power to secular temporal authority? Oh yeah, okay, it's healed. All right, got it, got that, got that, got that. No, uh, 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 uh. You can't tell me his authority over a hundred acres means the wound is healed. Amen. Does that make any sense? No. Should know. Mussolini was a shrewd politician. 
been reading quite a bit about him too. What happened then that I was told was the healing of the beast most of my life was like a pimple being healed on, on the side of your face when you've got cancer somewhere else. No, no, no. More evidence is on the way for that. For thousands of years in worldly kingdoms, beginning with Nimrod's Babylon after the flood, the church, a woman in biblical symbolism, would that church be pagan or papal? Makes no difference. Had ridden the government. A beast in biblical symbol. Symbolism. It was, it's always tyrannical. It's always despotic when the church and the state are married up. Amen. And brothers and sisters, they're already married in America. Amen. And it's not what most of us think. No. Maybe later. We know that the companion book of Daniel is Revelation. There is much significant overlap. And it's crucial to our study that we briefly examine the context and time of 1798, and then we'll look at those beasts or those leaders that I referenced just briefly in that previous paragraph. The French Revolution is begun in 1789, nine years earlier. It was beginning to wind down a little bit as France moved from anarchy in the streets. Sound familiar? Yeah. It better be. Move from anarchy in the streets, as we see in a number of American cities, to a growing demand for security. Sound familiar? Yeah. From anarchy, they went to the willingness to accept a di dictatorship. What had happened to cause such an upheaval in France? from which some historians say France has never fully recovered. What was happening in France in 1789? What was happening in America? We just, if we're in the last throes of an American revolution. And some totally naive uninformed pundits now are likening what's going on now to the American Revolution. That is utterly idiocy. It is French Revolution as I would prove. And relate it to Scripture. We know that in 1776 America de declared her independence from Great Britain. And 11 years later, 1787, just two years before the French got it kicked off, we have that wonderful constitutional convention. It is crucial, it's very crucial, it's vital that we understand when we think about the Constitution, the law of the land of America, at least it's supposed to be, has its foundation, has its reference point, in the Declaration of Independence. It's crucial. Every principle, I didn't say every detail, every principle in the Declaration of Independence came out of the Judeo-Christian ethic. Amen. Everyone. Yeah. Helen called it that grand old document. You know what grand means? I'm not trying to insult anybody. What grand means in the dictionary means foremost. Hmm. That foremost document. It's not the Constitution, it's the Declaration, it's the foremost document. That's why the left really hates our founding principles here in America today. It's because we were founded on Judeo-Christian ethics. And that's what makes us what's happening now so French, as we shall see. I got a question to ask Thomas Jefferson when I get to heaven. <laughs> and according to my brother, we are seventh cousins. He found himself in Paris. He wasn't in America during the Constitutional Convention. He was in Paris. He was helping them 
write a declaration of human rights mm. and the rights of the citizen. Thomas Jefferson, true. It's called the Declaration of Red, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. That's the French Declaration of Independence. It led to anarchy and to mob rule. Why the difference? That's why the pundits on the left do not call, and it really upsets me when they say, oh, well, what we see now is kind of like the American Revolution. In contrast to anarchy and mob rule, America's Declaration of Independence America's revolution never undermined rule of law and due process. Even you can look check your history on this. In Boston, when the British officers were charged with murder, do you know who their defense attorney was? John Adams. John Adams. Second president, who became the second president of the United States. These founders were determined to follow the rule of law. Yeah. And he did it quite, quite ably. Alas, not so in France. The Declaration of the Rights of Man of the City led of the citizen led not to the rule of law and due process, but to the random guillotine. And when that proved too slow, they would herd their enemies onto a barge, like I'm sure they'd like to do sometimes in Portland, onto a barge and then sink the barge while the people were tied up on the barge. Why the difference? Two declarations. You read them, you old, I've read them. You, well, I heard many times. I've just read the French. I just read it once and went, bingo. Many great similarities. But a glaringly huge, gigantic, critical difference in the two. I have to ask Thomas why he was so unsuccessful in consulting with the French and not encouraging them to make theirs look like ours. It certainly isn't. The success of the, real, of the American Revolution, it was not random, it was not a fate of living, as Madeleine Albright is teaching students at Georgetown University now, and that really upsets me too, that America just happened. Yeah. America just happened. Nothing special about America. No, nothing at all. Let me cite four, four phrases from the American, Revol American uh, Declaration of Independence that you will not find in the French. And then you have the answer. One, two radically different revolutions. You've heard of this statement? I'm just going to cite the references of the, uh, the phrases quickly. It's only a 1,300-word document. You can read it in a few minutes. The separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and, the, and of nature's God entitle. The separate and equal, speaking of the equality of human and humanity, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature, think about that the next time you hear about same sex marriage, laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. Mm -hmm. Our freedoms come from who? God. From God. Mm -hmm. And the next time you hear somebody say, well, that didn't include the African American. Yes, it did, and our founders knew it. Amen. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have, you can read a copy of the original draft by Jefferson, and it includes the black people. They couldn't get that past the southern people, so they, they said, we'll have to work on this, and they did. It's in the Constitution. Slave trade was outlawed in 1808. They gave it 20 years, and we're going to outlaw it. Lots I can say about that, but I'll, I'll go on. Second quote that you will not see in the French. 
even close to it. Men are endowed by their Creator with a capital what? C. C. With certain unalienable rights. That means they didn't come from Washington. They came from God. Amen. That's why the left hates American family. Because we say our rights came from God. God? Who is God that we should serve Him? Does it sound like Pharaoh? Yeah. Sort of kind of. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or as George Washington tweaked it, the pursuit of virtue. Not want and happiness, but virtuous happiness. Yeah. And then, number three, we the signers assemble, <clears throat> appealing to the supreme judge, and they capitalize supreme judge. The supreme judge of the world for the rectitude. Now that's kind of an archaic word, the rectitude. That is, we are committed for the right, to be right with God regarding this particular doctrine. Mm -hmm. And then fourthly, the last thing he said, with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. None of that occurs in the French Declaration. On the, on the contrary, out of their godless, their godless, their godless document arose only the celebration of reason separated from the revelation of God's word. God was declared dead. Out, marriage was considered virtually everything the left is attempting to destroy in America today as we worship here today, was in France. If that's too political for your ears, then you need to tweak them a little bit, my, is my suggestion. Because yeah. I'm talking about principles here. I'm not talking about a party. I'm talking about principles. You need a short excursion into how separation of church and state in America, even in this church, has become separation of God and state. And that's wrong. Amen. Amen. It's separation of church and state, not separation of God and state. Now, I just read those four God references, and I need to hurry along here, that the French godless revel uh, French definition of declaration did not have. And so it's not surprising that Karl Marx liked the French Revolution. It's not surprising that Charles Darwin liked the French Revolution. Are you listening to me today? Do you hear what, you hear what, the, what that's being, what's being said here? The evolution that we see that dominates our, our educational system. Scott. So Marxism that is now being celebrated in this current election under a little guise. It's God's. You know, they declared that God said they declared God is dead in France. Mm -hmm. And they celebrated the goddess of reason. Some prostitute from Paris was paraded before the assembled legislators. They've thrown God, but here's our new God, the goddess of reason. Let man create what's right in his own eyes. Even President Woodrow Wilson, you know when this really got started in America? Even before Wilson, but I'm going to name him by name. He admitted that the founding principles of America are Newtonian. That means they're creation-based. Amen. But, President Wilson said, actually wrote this before he became president, he said, we must transfer American thinking from Newtonian principles to Darwinian principles. Not surprising that he was the most segregationist president of the 20th century. Age 75. I love that age. 1903, Ellen was worried. She was warning. 1903, about
but the growing disdain for our founding principles as the Judeo-Christian God was being separated from the state. Separation of God from the state and one is only left with God being the state. It's a little wonder if in Paris streets the scream was kill the rich. <laughs> 